Okay, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. It's good to see you uh, in the room. Joining us online, thank you uh, very much to, uh, to be here as well. So this is the uh, Café Scientifique. This is uh, number three of uh, 2023. And I'm happy to say that we have uh, over 80 people registered. So there are people in the room, but there are also uh, many people that uh, join us uh, online. So um, thank you very much uh, uh, for doing that. My name is Annemieke Ferenhorst, the Associate Vice President Research at the uh, University of Manitoba. And let me begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oje Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I uh, would like to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of colonialism, and I also realize that we need to fight against the injustice that many indigenous people continue to face today. As a member of the University of Manitoba and an immigrant uh, to Canada, I am committed to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, one of the principles of the uh, truth and reconciliation is that we must create a more equitable and inclusive society by closing the gaps in social, health, and economic outcomes that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. So Café Scientific is a program that brings together experts that work at the University of Manitoba, researchers, and we bring them together with the general public. So we really have a dialogue about some of the impacts that are making they are making in their research program. And at the end of the conversation, we have a question and answer round. So people that are online are asked to submit questions, and people in the room certainly also can, uh, can ask questions. So the uh, Café Scientific is uh, open to everyone. Everyone can, can join us, and we are really pleased that uh, the numbers are increasing uh, with, uh, with every event that we have uh, this year so far. Uh, so again, feel free to bring your friends and family next time, uh, because we will continue scientifics on uh, on Wednesday nights throughout uh, the year. So tonight's uh, presentation will highlight an important long-term research project that incorporates the experience of 7,500 residents in Canada, United States, and Mexico over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. And our panelists that are joining us here today, they are lead researchers in this study, uh, and they are planning to co-moderate tonight's discussion as an interactive interview. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Laurie Wilkinson in the middle, Jeremy Patzer uh, to my side here, and Kiara Latner. And with that, thank you again for joining us, and I hope you will uh, enjoy tonight's evening. Thank you. Hello. I, we want to just begin with a question for Lori. Okay, I guess I'm doing it. I thought Lori was doing more of it. Um, Introducing the project, uh, this project began really, uh, has its infancy in a conference that Laurie was organizing uh, just before the pandemic hit, which was a metropolis conference, which had thousands of people coming into Winnipeg, and was really focusing on newcomers and experiences. And um, as a prelim to the conference, Laurie and the Association for Canadian Studies were running a series of weekly um, surveys in Canada, widespread surveys uh, between uh, the Association of Canadian Studies, Laurie Wilkinson, and Leger Marketing uh, was running the survey. And so as COVID hit and the conference got canceled, 
Lori came to me with the Association of Canadian Studies and really sold this idea of broadening the surveys, bringing in Canada, the US, and Mexico to look at the economic and socioeconomic uh, impacts of the pandemic. We knew it wasn't going to be two weeks, despite the fact that we remember those days when it was all just going to be two weeks and it was going to be over. Uh, so Lori called me. It was really a simple answer for me about my involvement. Uh, Lori works with newcomers. Association of Canadian Studies has a lot of newcomer focus. And Lori tried to sell me very easily on the need to bring in Indigenous people into the study. So with that, we started calling friends, called people from across the country, uh, researchers in the US, researchers in Mexico, and came up with a quite a large team of 35 scholars uh, to run this survey project. Uh, it was to involve both survey as well as some qualitative research, uh, really focusing in on trying to get over samples of newcomers, Indigenous people, and other racialized minorities in Canada and the US and Mexico. I really have to just acknowledge that I got involved uh, and it was odd for me because it was a time where there was nothing going on in my calendar. Uh, I was at home. It wasn't supposed to be me at home. I was supposed to be on the road for five months doing field work and other work. I'm a constitutional scholar. Jeremy is uh, also a, a more of a constitutional scholar, does law and sociology. And Lori was the only one that does survey work. And so with that, we got involved. And it was a really easy sell to our colleagues. Everyone wanted, I think almost everyone that I spoke with jumped on to engage with this. So with that, I think that uh, I can pass it on. Yeah, so um, we had, this is a two-pronged approach. Um, so when our conference was canceled, it was supposed to be uh, beginning on March the 19th of 2020. Um, we had to cancel it on the 13th of March. Um, so I won't talk to you about the horrors of that. But um, as part of the conference, as Kira mentioned, we were doing a national set of national surveys with Leger Marketing, where we were looking at the rise of racism. and. The pandemic was not in our, you know, we heard this thing, there might be some illness in China, um, and really it wasn't on our radar until beginning of March. And when it became clear we had to cancel the conference, we decided to make lemonade with all the lemons that were given to us. And so together with a lot of in-kind support from the Association from Canadian Studies and Leger Marketing, we were able to do weekly surveys with Canadians, Americans, and Mexicans every week starting March 20th of 2020. We have approximately 59 weeks of continuous data on all kinds of things measuring, uh, you know, your willingness to wear a mask, your willingness to practice social distancing, um, your willingness to obey the government, your trust in the government, um, experiences of, um, or, 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 or some of the most important questions we started to ask was in the fall of 2020, when we knew there was going to be a vaccine, but we didn't know what kind of vaccine it was and how long it was going to take to create. And so we started to ask questions of Canadians, Mexicans, and Americans, would they take this vaccine? And so we have a nice set of longitudinal data on people's willingness to accept the vaccine as the vaccine was being developed. So we'll share some of that information with you as well. But we also measured financial um, outcomes, mental health outcomes. We measured racism. So we've got coverage of the George, George Floyd um, incidents in the US, the January 6th um, problems that we saw in the US and of course the Freedom Convoy in Canada amongst many other things. So we were able to, um, after our weekly data challenges ended in mid 2021, we started um, with five omnibus surveys, pretty big surveys, 
Um, and so they were um, placed about three months apart. So we have, in addition to these weekly surveys, we have five big surveys asking people about various experiences related to COVID-19. And so we're, we're happy to share this with you tonight. We also have a qualitative component that we're not gonna share with you. So our data was collected um, by internet, but we knew, especially with the indigenous population and the newcomer population, but also with the refugee population in Mexico, we weren't gonna get those groups of people. So we have teams out um, who have done qualitative interviews with refugees crossing the US-Mexico border. We have qualitative teams doing interviews with the Navajo people um, in the United States, and we have qualitative teams doing interviews with indigenous and newcomer people in Canada. But tonight we'll just share with you a little teeny tiny slice of the massive amount of data that we have. So I'll pass it back to Kira to ask question number one. I was just gonna also add, uh, one way of doing the quantitative data in, with Indigenous people in Mexico was also to do it as a, more as a qualitative sampling, uh, sending people out with iPads or uh, the like, I guess they weren't iPads, but uh, to send people out with tablets into communities and use a real good system of teachers that spoke language that were fluent in multiple indigenous languages and multiple community languages to go out into community and instead of doing the survey online they ran the survey for people and it was a great way of actually engaging with uh, communities in Mexico that wouldn't have been able to participate in our online survey. The the first question that we have is, what do we know about who got vaccinated and who did not? So it's my turn again, sorry, <laughs> just because I'm the data kind of gal. So before we share with you our data, we wanted to reassure you that the data that we collected was representative of the people that we're studying. And so this slide just happens to provide kind of a little snapshot of who who is the typical vaccinated person. Um, people who are over the age of 60, people who have income of less than $60,000 a year, people who live in cities, people who are female, and people who are immigrants are more likely to be vaccinated. And this is according to official data. And if you wanna know where they come from or what their ethnic background might be, According to Statistics Canada, those people are South Asian, Chinese, Black, Filipino, Arabic, Latin American, Southeast Asian, West Asian, Kore Korean, or J Japanese. These are the groups of people who are more likely to get vaccinated than other groups. So how does our data kind of pan out? So um, we're only gonna talk about Canada and the US tonight because Mexico is a, a interesting case. Um, but a preview of the Mexican data, um, Mexicans are actually more alike in their vaccine habits, their mask wearing habits and their obedience to the government, their mental health and financial outcomes to Canadians than, th than these two groups are to Americans. Like the outliers on almost all of these measures in our study were the Americans, which we found to be kind of surprising. Tonight we're gonna to talk about um, indigenous peoples in Canada and the US and uh, newcomers in Canada and the US. Knowing that 69% um, of the American population has been fully vaccinated and according to the CDC, being fully vaccinated is only two shots. So I've provided the two shot data for, can for Canada. Um, so in Canada, that number for adults is 84.5%. Um, with 87% having had one dose, and in the United States, 82. So um, Americans overall didn't do as well with vaccination um, as we did, um, but we did pretty darn good, considering it was a brand new vaccine. Um, but when we're looking at the populations of interest this afternoon, or th this evening, I guess, um, According to the official statistics, 91% of people who are First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada um, have been vaccinated. So officially, they did a little bit better than the Canadian average. Um, children in all groups didn't do as well, so it's about 50%, with the very young children being less likely to be vaccinated than the older children. 
In the US, the rates are a little bit lower at about two thirds of indigenous peoples in the US. Um, and I included Pacific Islander uh, people as a separate group, but coincidentally, they have the same uh, vaccine rate too. So comparatively, um, our indigenous peoples in Canada did much better in terms of vaccine uptake than they did in the United States. Interestingly, in Canada, finding immigration data about newcomers is, well, difficult. Um, mostly it's because uh, vaccine data collection was a provincial responsibility and some provinces did better than other provinces in terms of collecting and releasing this data. So we're stuck with the data that we have collected. And in our sample, we found 93% of, of immigrants in Canada have been vaccinated um, compared to 83% in the US. But as far as we can tell, that seems to be um, not so far off the mark um, in terms of the, of the research that we found. Um, so in actuality, um, vaccine uptake amongst the, the four groups that we're most interested here tonight is actually better than the Canadian um, and the American average. Um, in terms of who are the likely people within these groups to be vaccinated, um, amongst immigrants, they're um, between the ages of 35 and 55, and they're male, um, with um, making an income of between 40,000 and 99,000 a year. Um, and then in terms of indigenous people, um, they're more likely to, to be in that age group as well. They're more likely to be male, um, but having a slightly higher average income. People who are unvaccinated, however, are uh, in terms of uh, indigenous people, are between the ages of 35 and 44, but are also male, male. So you're probably wondering, well, why are males are all in these categories? That's because males, period, were more likely to take the vaccine than females were. Um, and this is backed up by some of the other uh, research reports from different countries as well. Um, but unvaccinated people, one of the big um, commonalities is, is that they weren't making a lot of money. These people had less than $25,000 a year income. They tended to be less educated. In fact, many of them didn't have high school diplomas and many of them were unemployed. Um, and this didn't vary between groups at all. Um, but one of the interesting things is, uh, particularly for the American group, um, political ideology had a big impact, especially in the US. Um, so we've got a master's student who's working on this paper for her thesis and she's almost done. And her research reveals that, not surprisingly, people who held extreme right-wing beliefs are significantly less likely to be vaccinated. What we see in the media in Canada and Mexico is, is oh, we don't have to worry because we don't have as extreme political leaning people in Canada as there are in the US. That's actually wrong. We're able to take the um, extremely right wing leaning people in Canada and we found that they're also more likely not to be vaccinated. It's just that their vaccination rates were much higher because you know, we, we were approaching 90% vaccination in our country. Um, so the moral of this story is, is that if we look at political ideology, Canadians and Mexicans can't sit back and uh, congratulate ourselves too much because we do, and that, that was preliminary estimates, so she's doing a regression equation, but preliminarily, that is one of the strongest indicators of whether or not you're gonna get vaccinated. It's not your income, it's not your education, it's your political ideology. So I think I have to pass this over to Jeremy, who's gonna ask me a question. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to start on the second question here. It's actually going to be a question that gets distributed between the three of us, but first one has to take a crack at it is Laurie. And I was going to be a bit cheeky there when, when you were introducing the project here and you said that uh, when Laurie called, there was just no question. I just thought to myself, I was fraught with all kinds of self-questioning getting into survey research, but uh, it was one of I those moments. I conned you into it. Yes, thinking back to my youth, right? And you have like all the friends in the vehicle on the road and they stop and they looks like they're going to a party and they're like, get in, get in. And you're thinking to yourself, is it a wise decision to get in? But I, I got in at some point along the way for better or for worse. Um, so for question two, we're thinking about the fact that, you know, debates on the social determinants of health and vaccine policy and all the other issues that are nested in with this were really at the forefront as different jurisdictions were formulating their pandemic response. And 
they were at the forefront of our minds as well for this research. So this brings our second broad question to which all, of, all three of us will speak uh, in turns here. And, and the question as I've written it down here is, what was the nature of the pandemic response in so far as the respective communities are concerned? Uh, so yeah, to start, Lori, uh, you said you're going to talk about pandemic response and newcomer populations in Canada and the US. Yeah, so the experience of COVID, as we all know from media reports, was not the same for everyone, right? So you have people who had to be working in person, had to be working in very dangerous situations. Um, it played along income lines, so people who were, had less income tended to be the folks that had to be out and about and risking their lives. Um, if we talk about newcomers, um, some of the biggest early outbreaks were in the meat processing plants in Canada and Mexico. So we probably all remember the um, Cargill meat processing plant in High River, um, Alberta. Um, at the time the outbreak occurred, which was December of 2020, 950 people were sick with COVID and it was North America's biggest outbreak. Um, two people died plus one of the contacts died. One of the interesting things when we trace contacts of people who were ill, that outbreak was started because people were carpooling from Calgary to High River and they were the, they were carpooling together, the employees were carpooling all together, but in Calgary, their spouses were working in hospitals. So um, it was the spouses that worked in the hospitals that came home, brought COVID to them, they got sick, they passed it on in the car or on the meat processing plant floor. Um, so American evidence, um, which turned out to be from the largest outbreak after that is in Sioux Valley, South Dakota, also at a meat processing plant. Um, 929 people were confirmed sick, um, plus 8% of their contacts, two people died. But the highest rate of infection was amongst the newcomer workers who were working on the plant floor. And the best estimate or the best guess one could make if you were gonna get sick is how close you were working to the worker next to you. And so if you couldn't have six feet between yourself and the other worker, you were probably gonna get sick. Now, epidemiologists also point out that the meat processing plants, there's not good air ventilation, it's cold. Um, and so the virus could stay alive much longer. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that two thirds of the people who work in meat processing plants are newcomers in both countries and about 18% of them are former refugees and another 18% are temporary foreign workers. So the hit to the newcomers, especially early on um, in the virus spread um, was, was quite evident. The other group of people were healthcare workers, of course, that we learned uh, gained early and quick exposure to COVID-19. In Canada, 33% of the nurses are born outside of Canada. In the US, it's 25%. And so the burden of disease was held um, much higher amongst immigrants and refugees in both countries than the American born and the Canadian born folks. So um, part of the storying of the, um, of the, you know, how the vaccine rolled out and how, the, how COVID happened um, can partly be understood by understanding the stories of newcomers. Jeremy? Okay, yeah, I'll go second. Um, I, I was going to take it over to talk about Indigenous peoples in, in Canada here. Um, you know, it, it probably doesn't come as great surprise as social scientists, the way we're approaching the research, you know, the, the things coming from the existing literature that were in the back of our head were things like the social determinants of health. Um, and really, like, just to mention a few of these, these kinds of social determinants of health, one really can perceive, perceive of how like inequalities that are pre-existing in things like maybe housing or access to health services uh, really make a difference when you have the onset of something like a pandemic. Um, now, also as we've been going through this, and, and like Kira mentioned, she and I are both kind of um, indigenous legal scholars. She looks uh, a lot at law and politics. I look at the socio sociology of law and indigenous rights. 
we've been kind of thinking this through and, and starting to theorize for some papers this idea of, of you know, talking about, uh, trying to find some space to theorize and talk about this idea of the political determinants of health as well. Um, and this has to do with policies, but it also has to do with the really complex jurisdictionalities that we deal with in the Canadian context that make pandemic responses a really complex affair. Um, when we're talking about Canadian federalism, the division of powers between the different levels of government, I mean, in short, what we can say is that the complicated jurisdictionality surrounding Indigenous issues is such that the Crown's relationship with Indigenous peoples is considered a federal responsibility. But at the same time, many of you know that uh, so many of the lands, the laws, the services that many Indigenous peoples encounter in their daily lives are under provincial jurisdiction. And that really complicates things. And it, it, when it concerns healthcare, it could be either, right? Depending upon the geographical point of service, whether the person is First Nations, Inuit, or Metis, all makes a difference as to the delivery of healthcare services. Um, <clears throat> An example uh, that I have in mind, right, is um, we have uh, uh, part of Health Canada, I think it is, and this is Indigenous Services Canada now, that we affectionately refer to as FNIB, the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. But the non-insured health benefits that are offered by the federal government are extended to registered and recognized status First Nations or status Indians and Inuit individuals. Um, we have a 2016 decision that came out with the Supreme Court of Canada saying that Métis and non-status First Nations are meant to be a federal re responsibility as well, at least the Crown's relationship to them. But there has been no commensurate kind of bringing in of Métis or non-status First Nations under uh, the policies and the purview of something like the Non-Insured Health Benefits Program. Um, also tied into this though, there's this full and storied history that we can't get into here, like it, and it's packed into a very short, intense time. Those moments we all remember being in lockdowns and under this form of panic, where we have indigenous governments themselves that are engaging in regional and local pandemic responses of all sorts to keep their communities safe. And it, it's something that's really of interest for the research of Karen and I when we talk about uh, forms of stealth and, and practice sovereignties or, or you know, sovereignties of indigenous peoples and, and forms of self-government. Um, but we, we, unfortunately we can't get into that right now. Uh, what I will mention as far as the vaccine rollout in Canada is concerned, while, of course, complex jurisdictionalities make for complex and very uneven policies and vaccine rollout. Um, as the province has obtained allotments of vaccine, they ultimately chose how they wanted to distribute them or how they felt best to distribute them. Uh, and a shout out, though, we have colleagues, uh, people who worked uh, for government and, and Manitoba Health, but colleagues from the university as well, um, that uh, worked with certain groups that helped to bring out some real concrete data. And I'm thinking in terms of we also have the race, ethnicity, and ind indigeneity um, data that came out in the summer of 2021 for wave three that was actually acknowledging the heightened risk for indigenous peoples. Um, despite those kinds of efforts though, as far as the government was concerned, I would say that the pandemic response was still not a shining moment for the, uh, for the province. In the early days of vaccine rollout, the provincial government um, was pushing the federal government for prioritized access to vaccines for indigenous people. And that sounds ideal, right? It's a policy option that really would surely benefit provinces with high indigenous populations. And Manitoba proportionately has the highest proportion of indigenous peoples as far as the provinces are concerned. Um, after learning though that the prioritized access for First Nations uh, vaccines would actually just come out of the general supply of doses coming to the province and wasn't a separate additional supply for the province, our premier at the time publicly complained that the vaccine rollout puts Manitobans at the back of the line. And then the response then coming from the Winnipeg Free Press was a, a column in particular. Well, that's really implying that in, indigenous peoples aren't actually Manitobans. Um, the other thing I'd mention that uh, really sticks with me as far as the vaccine rollout, other provinces, Ontario I have in mind with cousins there, they included the Métis in their prioritized vaccine uh, rollouts for indigenous peoples, sometimes even including their non-indigenous spouses who shared a household with them. Manitoba did not, despite the fact that we have a significant Métis population spread across urban, rural, and remote locations. Um, and this is something that's of, of great interest to me because the Manitoba Métis Federation in the province here, it really eagerly exercises its self-governmental muscles whenever it's given the opportunity. Um, it has forms of service delivery and outreach that uh, applies to the urban city just as much as to remote and rural uh, Métis villages and Métis locations. 
Um, and the MMF headquarters in the city even houses its own pharmacy. So I, I think that was really a, a lost opportunity for even more uh, effective pandemic response. But with that, um, I think I went on a bit long there, Kiara, so we should go over to you to maybe chat about uh, uh, the indigenous pandemic response in the US. In terms of indigenous pandemic response in the US, I think it should be noted that when COVID really first started hitting the news and we saw New York as this huge hotspot in North America, uh, the real hotspot was actually the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation is larger than 17 states and it covers at, uh, transects the corners of New Mexico, uh, Utah, and Arizona. And on the Navajo Nation, uh, it was the largest hotspot. 2,000 people by May uh, wore down with COVID. And what was amazing is, is there was no federal response. Uh, much like social and political determinants of health here in Canada, we saw the same sort of issues happening and really exacerbated and really shown by the, what was happening with the Navajo Nation. What was amazing was that instead of having a federal response to a community that is so underfunded and has been underfunded for centuries, with 50% of their homes not having running water, over 50% of the community not having electricity, and really no internet through, I think it was about 40% of the territory. It wasn't the federal government who is obligated by law to provide for Indigenous health. It was actually a response from Ireland that came in and helped provide uh, funding for services, funding for the community to go and get PPE. And it was because the Choctaw following the Trail of Tears in the US had heard from one of their prisoners who was an Irishman about the Irish potato famine. Uh, threw in all the money that the Choctaw people had after this horrible Trail of Tears where they were relocated to Oklahoma, sent the money over to Ireland and Ireland rallied and sent over a million dollars in the first month of the pandemic or the first two months of the pandemic to the Navajo Nation. Navajo Nation ended up being one of the greatest hotspots that we see. And it really just shows that exacerbation that happens because of both social determinants of health as well as political determinants of health. We cannot forget that the federal government in the US had the responsibility for indigenous healthcare in the states. With this, I think it also really just shows some of the jurisdictional cha challenges. And a story that comes up and that I was taken aback by today was one that seemed all too close to a situation that happened in Manitoba during the last Pen, it wasn't quite a pandemic, but H1N1. Uh, when a community here or several communities in northern Manitoba called out for supplies during H1N1, instead of being sent supplies, they got sent body bags. And when Seattle uh, First Nation or Indian Health Board in Seattle called out for federal funding that had just been released finally in the end of May, following a month long legal challenge that delayed the response and delayed federal funding getting to communities, they were confronted with the barrier that they were an urban uh, healthcare provider and therefore did not qualify for federal funds. The state would not fund them and all the state sent them when asking for uh, masks, PPE to be on vaccine lists was body bags and toe tags. And so it really shows that exacerbation of uh, 
how federalism really, even in the states, uh, really impacted indigenous communities, both urban and on reserve. And I'll go back to the Navajo case. And it was the Navajo that really made my decision on getting involved with this because looking at what was happening, I knew that that same sort of uh, possibility for COVID running wild on First Nations was there. And I wanted to be sure that we could tell some of those stories, that we had the data, because while I don't do data, I had never run a survey or taken a quantitative class in my life. Um, I knew that that was important as a political scientist, and I knew that governance really requires, and good governance requires that data. So the Navajo really were, was that experience that made me say to Lori, okay, let's go, um, without question, and probably should have questioned that a lot, but didn't. Um, but looking at what happened around the Nav Navajo Reserve also just shows that federal state power grab and how communities were really lost in this, in this tug of war. The Navajo did a tremendous job in showing the resilience. They have the highest level of vaccine take up in the US. They worked from the day one to supply their elders with food so elders did not have to come into the grocery stores or leave the reserve. They worked hard to get everything that that community needed to survive and to thrive. It wasn't their first pandemic. And that's something that we heard throughout Indian country, both sides of the border. There have been histories of pandemics all the way through colonization. But for the Navajo, uh, they're surrounded by what they call border towns. And that is communities that are Navajo or largely indigenous that aren't reserved communities and that fall under state, state responsibility. And one of them was Gallup, New Mexico. Gallup had just had an election, a new mayor, a Navajo mayor, really phenomenal community activists. And on the third day after he was elected, he got a call from the state governor explaining that there was no resources coming to Gallup, but that they were going to close Gallup down and send state troopers to ensure that no one left Gallup so that COVID would not spread from this Navajo border town off into the rest of the state. And that's how the state dealt with it. Gallup was not a federal responsibility. Gallup was therefore being deemed not to be a state responsibility either. In the end, Gallup gets more resourced, but it took a lot of strength and determination of political leaders to overcome those political determinants of Indigenous health during the pandemic. And that resilience and that stamination of that nation uh, both as stealth sovereignty and really just taking up new jurisdictions. So, thank you. All right, at this point, I think I'm, I'm sitting pretty because I'm just asking questions. This is the way I kind of uh, wanted this to happen. And, and I'm gonna ask the last couple of questions and uh, let my colleagues loose on these. Um, I'm, I am hoping though that someone is keeping tabs on time and they'll throw something at me if they think we can't do question number four. We, uh, we're gonna do question number three first and we'll see what happens from there. I will say though, I think question number four is one of the most fascinating ones, but I'll just, I'll just drop that right now. But, um, question number three, um, because the pandemic originated in China, China, there has been a lot of anti-Asian hate and racism. In fact, anti-Asian hate has increased markedly during this time. Additionally, our data reveals that racism against indigenous peoples, anti-Semitism directed against Jewish peoples, and Islamophobia are also on the rise. So I was wondering if the two of you could speak a little bit to what our data says. I think we are going to start here with Kiara, aren't we? Yep. If we take a look at the screen, it, uh, we see two very different experiences 
in terms of those two graphs. One shows that Indigenous people are experiencing more racism as our newcomers in both Canada and the US. Canada faring uh, slightly or really quite better than uh, Indigenous people in the US as well as in um, newcomers in the US. But then we have our other slide that uh, talks about current relations between people. And I don't think it is surprising that Indigenous people saw a rise in racism during the pandemic. Many of us will remember uh, this current Premier, Heather Stephenson as Health Minister, and the past Premier as uh, Long Plain First Nation uh, out in Portage, having extra vaccine, decided to vaccinate others. It decided to share the vaccine instead of letting that vaccine that was already open go into a garbage can to call those people, including newcomer organizations, that service the community, that provided uh, uh, workers both in the community in terms of teachers, but also whose businesses Long Plain First Nation members went to. So the grocery store and made sure that people got vaccinated that really should be first in case the teachers, those working in, on the front line. And we saw the rollout or the fallout from that where the province got really upset and Manitobans got upset because they weren't getting vaccinated. But, and we see Stats Canada showing some of the same documents or some of the same sorts of stats. But what's interesting is that StatsCan doesn't actually track much in terms of anti-Indigenous racism. It didn't track, and we can't find a lot of stats in terms of intergroup racism or how groups are feeling towards each other during the pandemic. And what's sad is we also have a missed opportunity because our data here on the decline of relations between ethnic groups doesn't have Indigenous as a category. And I, we wanted to just raise this because it shows some of the methodological issues of two research groups that work with two very different groups coming together and trying to work together on the run and we were really doing this on the run. We sometimes had a week uh, turnaround between, well, of course, a week turnaround between our weekly pools, but, uh, uh, and then there was a point in this that I was the one that was running the show for, because Lori was off for a while, and I was running the show running survey data for someone that has never run a survey in my life. And Indigenous people in the end got left off. And it was really because of an interplay between, you know, two groups of researchers that really had some difficulties in trying to figure out how to engage in anti-Indigenous research and how to also ask those same questions in Canada, the US and Mexico. And sometimes those conversations got uh, a bit difficult. And um, I think that it just shows the struggle between, not really a struggle, those difficult conversations that we've really learned about and, and learned how to uh, engage with each other more effectively over the years of the pandemic. So we don't have the data that I think we should have possibly had, but I think that we know based upon cases like Joyce Esuquan uh, and the data that we pull and this data on experiencing more racism around the pandemic, I believe that that set comes in just after Joyce Esuquan. And we can also remember, you know, all of the times that we spent watching TV here and watching the reaction of the premier to Marsha Anderson and others. So we know that it's there. And I think we, uh, as researchers, can dig deeper 
whether or not we have the data that we can show, we know that it's there. And, but that data is also there and needed for other groups. And we could have done a better job because we didn't always ask about racism on all of the surveys. And looking back, I think that that's a question that we should have asked, especially given the rise of 301% on anti-Asian on anti immigrant, anti-Asian uh, racism just in that first year of the pandemic. So with that, I'll turn it to Lori. Yeah, so uh, I, I was the dropout. <laughs> I got super sick, so I was incognito for, for three, well, for six months actually. But um, we did manage, to, we are able to, in some of the later surveys, measure some anti-Indigenous racism. So the table on the left, um, probably can't see the writing, but um, Indigenous people in the US, 33% uh, of them um, said to us later in the COVID pandemic that racism against them had increased. These are based on a number of questions about racism as opposed to just one. In Canada, that number was 17%. Um, and then when we ask immigrants the same question, 27% in the US and 21% in Canada um, had experienced increased levels of racism during the pandemic. When we wanted to ask people about their perceptions of the relationships that groups of people have, so everybody was posed this second question. So since COVID-19, would you describe the current relations between immigrants and non-immigrants, and I've reported here, 33% of Canadians and 38% of Americans report that the relationship got worse. Um, if you look at um, the numbers for Asian and non-Asians, typically the same. Um, Muslim and non-Muslims, those are around 20%. Um, this question, it was asked in 2022, I suspect if we ask it right now, um, that the numbers of, or the perception of the relations between Jewish people and people who are not Jewish are actually much worse. Um, so um, in an upcoming Leger survey, it won't be part of this study, but they are gonna be asking those questions as well. And then um, anti-black racism, um, to me, I was surprised it wasn't much higher um, because we were asking this question at the height of the George Floyd pro protests as well. 25% um, in Canada and 33% in the US felt that those relations had gotten worse. Now, our, our survey is mostly quantitative, but we wanted to try to capture open statements from our panel as much as we can without burdening the respondent. And so we have pages and pages of question uh, responses to the question of, of, you know, what was your experience with, with racism during the uh, COVID outbreak? So we have lots of Chinese um, Americans and Chinese Canadians and even Chinese Mexicans um, telling us that um, you know, they experienced racism because of the connection between COVID and China. Um, we had indigenous people who were saying that um, they felt that everyone was more openly racist um, and that they'd been disrespected about their religion and their skin color. And then uh, for African Americans and Black Canadians, um, people talking about how um, racism is, you know, just increased, and and what was common is more in your face now, both in Canada and the United States. And so, um, although um, our qualitative data will will provide much more nuance to these statements it is disheartening the number of statements that we uh, received with, re with regard to uh, racism. Um, you are only getting a sparkling of data. <laughs> like we have spreadsheet upon spreadsheet. So um, I think that, you know, we would entertain questions to pull this data out a little bit further, but for the purposes of this presentation tonight, this kind of gives you an idea or an introduction to our study. And I think we're ready for number four. Oh, good, good. That's Excellent. that's great. I, I, I feel that there might be even a couple of questions related to this, so I'm really happy mm -hmm. that we do have the time to get into it. Um, for question four, what we actually just wanted to talk about then were the myths associated with vaccines, with, with not getting vaccinated. So who do we want to start with this? Is it Lori? Yeah. 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 
Okay. So um, because we started this data collection so early, we have, you know, before the vaccine was developed, as the vaccine was developed, and after the vaccine was rolled out, we have all kinds of data. But you really can't understand what people think about the COVID-19 vaccine until you understand what they feel about vaccines in general. And most of us in the audience remember uh, the 1999 uh, paper in the British Medical Journal uh, by Andrew Wakefield and his sample of 12 people. Um, he made the bold statement that the MMR vaccine led to autism in children, which in turn led, in, led to a worldwide panic about vaccinating your children. And so now, um, 20 years later, even though that link was never proven, in fact, the paper was pulled, there are groups of people that refuse to vaccinate their children because they think that the MMR vaccine causes uh, autism. We needed to know who are these people because most of those people, they have all kinds of reasons for rejecting the vaccine, right? They reject vaccines because of their belief in this bad myth. Um, they reject the vaccine because it's against their religious beliefs. They reject the vaccines because of uh, political beliefs. And we needed to be able to identify that group of people because those people reject all vaccines, no matter what we tell them. What we wanted to do is have that group of people and compare them to the group of people who are rejecting the COVID-19 vaccine because that group of people is different. And in fact, most people we spoke to and continued to speak to about the COVID-19 vaccine, they aren't anti-vaccine. In fact, they'll make great pains to tell you that they're vaccinated for everything. They just don't trust the COVID-19 vaccine. So this opened up a, a great venue of study for us where we um, have these three groups of people, the vaccine takers, the not vaccine takers at all, and then the people who just won't take the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so we became kind of popular with the public health set. Um, we met with Theresa Tam. We even met with various provincial and state governments in Canada, US and Mexico, because everybody wanted to have this data. So what we found with um, Indigenous peoples is that uh, First Nations people who have status, uh, about 24% of them reject all vaccines. Um, and so it, it's, it's, I'm not an expert on this, but um, I don't think that there's too many studies that have even bothered to ask First Nations people what they think about vaccines. People who don't have status, 11% um, of them reject all vaccines. Um, amongst the Métis, it's similar, it's about 12%. Um, but those figures, the average for people in Canada rejecting all vaccines is only 7.3%. Um, so moving from this set of data, we have a, a better understanding of who is against vaccines just because they're a vaccine. We have a bunch of open-ended questions or statements too about why people um, would reject a vaccine. Um, and the number one being is I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, I just don't wanna take the COVID-19 vaccine. Like by far, that was the, the number one message that we were getting not only from indigenous people, but from other people as well. Um, and when we asked them specifically about the COVID-19 vaccine, the people who were edgy about taking the vaccine were more like, I wanna take a wait and see approach. Let's see what happens to other people and then I'll consider it. Um, but then there was some wild hype around the vaccine. It's gonna change my DNA. There's 5G technology and people are gonna be tracking me. And you know, we asked people in later surveys if they were serious about these myths and they were, they weren't trying to be funny. Uh, some people try to be funny when they fill out a survey, but they, you know, many of the people who said these things were actually very serious. Um, when we looked at the myth beliefs that they had, uh, the first, I guess it had been survey, omnibus survey number two, we asked them a free form question. So if you are afraid to take the COVID-19 vaccination, we want to know why. So they could put down anything. So we've group them together here so that you can see some of the results. Um, effects fertility was a prominent one, it was not the number one one, um, although it was number one for indigenous people. Um, and, but it does explain why more men take the vaccine than women did. So the fertility 
um, myth um, was held by 41% of Canadians and 35% of Americans, but it was the number one reason that Indigenous people in both countries would not take the vaccine. Um, another prominent uh, reason that people wouldn't want to take the vaccine was I've been COVID infected before, so I don't need a vaccine. That's 40% of Canadians and 32% of Americans. The number one reason that people would not take the vaccine is the belief that the vaccine was rushed. That somehow the technology was so new and so brand new and you know, we didn't know if it would turn your eyes green or turn them backwards. Um, and so um, this belief was held by 66% of Canadians and 63% of Americans who refused to take the vaccine. This is a myth but I think it's a problem with how the vaccines were rolled out. That M, um, the, the new um, technology, I'm not a scientist, but the new technology used to deliver this vaccine, yes, indeed, is new, but has been under development since the 1980s. So it's not new, um, it's just newer. And I think that all the governments did a really poor job of educating all of the public about what this technology was, how it interacted in your body, and how it was going to affect you. And this did not change as we kept asking this question because it's good longitudinal practice to ask the same questions over and over. This still remains the number one reason why people won't take the vaccine. And when you ask people today why they won't want to take the vaccine, they think that a side effect is going to happen five years down the road or 10 years down the road, and it's gonna affect my fertility, or I'm gonna get cancer, or I'll have a heart attack. Um, the other um, heavily believed myth was they were naturally immune. Um, we were tempted to put that with the, I've been previously COVID infected, but when you ask people, they actually believe that COVID-19 had been around for a long time or some version of it has been floating around, or I have a good immunity. So I'm just gonna, I think many of you, if you followed social media, you know, I'm gonna let my immunity f um, uh, protect me from the vaccine or protect me from the virus. I don't need a vaccine. Um, so those were the major causes of, of, of concern amongst people, at least in terms of their myth beliefs. Um, do you want me to keep going? I can. Okay. Um, I think that one of the things that we have found in uh, all of our conversations within the Indigenous research team, as well as by being able to drill down to some of the big open-ended questions on vaccine hesitancy, was that while there has been a slight transformation uh, through three of the the first three waves of our study in terms of beliefs about, you know, why beliefs explaining vaccine hesitancy, whether it is anti-vax or political belief or you've already had COVID, what we really came to understand is that so many of these explanations have stories behind them and that we have to also dig deeper into some of the stories and some of the explanations and that those stories and explanations may not be the same community to community. And so messaging really needed to be more focused on communities and understanding the history. And one of the big reasons for Indigenous people that was thought to be the biggest reason for Indigenous people, but it turned out not to be, was the whole issue of um, experiments that were run uh, in most residential schools or a lot of the residential schools. Experiments had been run on other vaccines. Experiments had been run in both Canada and the US on nutrition. And there had been huge issues that were well known throughout Indigenous communities about these histories, about very dark histories. It ended up that this was easily tackled uh, by indigenous, me indigenous media, community media, uh, networks within community, and social media networks 
But one of the things that kept coming up, and I think why we have determined or we have theorized and really drawn out why uh, the issue of fertility ended up being the number one issue for Indigenous people on both sides of the border was the whole issue of how many times Indigenous communities have faced uh, governments uh, and colonialism as an attempt to destroy nations. And that many communities, many um, people just were not going to take that chance. There had been, and there's still a court case in Canada that isn't that old that uh, of forced sterilization in Manitoba. Uh, not even years old, but maybe one year old the last. And so that really is one of the sounding uh, stories that really have resonated across the surveys, across so many of our discussions, trying to get under and to understand what this data says or maybe why people are believing. So it's not just looking at the myths and looking at you know the Donald Trump-like stories, but we have to look further than what Donald Trump was spewing in that very day and really try and understand them in a historical context. And that when we try to understand in a historical context, I think we get a fuller picture and our qualitative data is, is hopefully going to give more of that experience and more of that story. So anything to add there, Jeremy? I think just to say, like when you mentioned this expectation that we almost had that what had come out in the past number of years, coming from historians and historical research, but then it made it to mainstream media talking about forced medical experimentation, forced nutrition experimentation on children in residential schools, that we thought that there, there's probably going to be this, this sizable measurable impact that we're going to see in the data and not seeing it. In some sense, those are the really interesting moments when we're doing this kind of research, right? And, and Laurie can speak probably to the having more of these moments uh, than us since uh, we are not the survey researchers, but something that forces you to go back and to re-theorize and re-hypothesize and try and understand why there's something different than what you expected. Um, and then maybe on some level it just speaks to where people access their information. And then I, I had to, like, so I have heard people mentioned this type of thing before about you know past experiments not sure if i trust the vaccine but on some level it caused me to kind of think about it longer and think about it deeper and i thought well you know a lot of that research did come out from allied historians right and and, and so and we kind of circulated in somewhat rarefied circles now as academics that we're very familiar with that right and the, the things that are coming out with the historical research of some of our colleagues across the country um, and then they make their way to mainstream media. But when it comes down to it, that people probably, you know, they source their information from a very a wide variety of different sources and not necessarily the same sources as us and just forces us to kind of step back a little bit, look at the data and realize that. One of those sources and the number one source for Indigenous people was uh, Facebook and social media. And, uh, you know, one of the, we were at a conference in Toronto listening to uh, a group from Australia, uh, community researchers and community respondents in COVID that reminded us that uh, who's on social media and that's your family and your community. And this was a way for communities to talk to each other house to house during the pandemic when there was a lockdown and Australia went through a huge lockdown. And so I think that those social media networks really do speak to that, that that's where media, what media indigenous communities were uh, talking through and really working so many of these issues out that if they hadn't heard about these experiments, they were even getting over some of those, uh, those histories and, and thinking about those grandmothers that they had to protect and looking at social media. Uh, so many times I've come across stories about you have to get the in Australia, it was always you have to get the jab for for granny or nanny, but it is those elders that are the knowledge keepers, that are the language holders. And in BC, there was a couple uh, posts in social media that came across my feeds of a community with one fluent speaker of the language, and that was their treasure trove and how a community had to rally around 
to ensure that that speaker, that knowledge house, didn't get COVID. So there's a, a lot of uh, underpinning all of these stories and all of this data. And I think that we have so much that we need to go through and it's gonna be years of uh, a treasure trove for people. Okay, should we wrap it up with that and then switch over to questions? Yes, okay, sounds good. So we'd like to thank our humongous research team. Oh yes, of course, <laughs> yes. Um, shout out to Nicole at the back of the room. She's one of our research assistants and there's some of our friends online. Um, but really this is, this is a large international team that pulled this together, um, especially when the lead researcher happened to drop out for being sick for six months. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we do need to thank our funders. Our main funder is CIHR, but the University of Manitoba um, provided us some uh, very valuable funding. And um, we have written a lot, uh, but there's lots more to write. So um, we have two websites. If you want the short and sweet version of the papers, you would go to covidimpacts.ca, um, and there'll be two or three pagers on a variety of different topics and we're putting new stuff up all the time. If you want something a bit more in depth, and by in depth I mean eight page to 10 pages, um, there's reports on the uh, Association for Canadian Studies website, um, quite a number of reports about COVID-19. Um, welcome you to uh, check them out and uh, thank you very much for your attention as we babbled on about our big long project. I guess we'll open up the floor to questions. Yeah, are there any questions from the floor or anyone online? Uh, we haven't had any questions online, but uh, I see the address has just popped up on the screen. So if anyone watching from home wants to submit a question, you can email us at research.communications at humanitoba.ca. I guess I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I always wonder about the, um, the influence of social media and what people uh, hear and read. And, and, and you probably have um, gotten this question before. Um, but with the large data set that you, that you have, um, were you able to look at pockets uh, in the country where maybe uh, access to the internet is not readily available and compare that with pockets where internet is available. Um, and, and if you have, um, can you actually see differences because of the influence of the internet on people's decision-making process? Because it uh, was an online survey, uh, we do not have uh, a representative of pockets without much internet. Uh, one of the things that we're still ongoing is a qualitative sampling and uh, trying to do some qualitative research with community or in locations, especially in locations with, uh, that would have been harder to reach so indigenous communities, northern communities, um, we have done some more research, uh, qualitative research already with newcomers in uh, the GTA as well as Halifax, around yeah. Halifax. Um, and we, in the US, one of our partners uh, was able to do a great sampling or a great the number of qualitative interviews on the US-Mexico border. Uh, many of the people in living in camps uh, or so-called camps. Um, I don't think that uh, I would equate them with camping. Um, but uh, a lot of the newcomer groups are refugees and uh, those that have been, were, have been imprisoned by the former president along the border. Uh, so we have a series of interviews there, as well as we have a series of interviews on 
uh, the U.S. borderlands amongst the uh, Tahoe Nation and Tohono Nation, um, not the Navajo Nation, but mostly in Arizona and looking at indigenous peoples in those borderland communities. Um, so not in Canada, but yes in Mexico, yes in the U.S. And that was supposed to be my job in Canada and that's been my big failure on the, on the project. That other things have come up and taken my attention from getting this side of the research done, so. This is a monster project, right? So it's not your fault. Um, I just wanna say that on the Mexico-US border, when we talk to the people about COVID-19, the rates of COVID-19 in those camps were higher than the American average. But when we asked them if they were afraid of COVID-19, they're like, no, I need to get to the US. Like that mm -hmm. overbearing, like that was the number one problem and that they would deal with COVID-19 as an aside. They hoped that they wouldn't get sick and they hoped that one day they could get the vaccine because of course they weren't getting vaccinated over there. Um, but that is one of the overwhelming findings from the interviews that we did on the US-Mexico border that I recall. Thank you. Great. Uh, we do have a question online. Uh, this is, uh, comes from a student named Amy. Uh, Amy says, great presentation. Uh, given your data on vaccination hesitancy, what do you think are the major implications for media coverage of future health emergencies? Oh, it's almost like we planted that one. <laughs> So because we have all of this longitudinal data on why people were getting vaccinated and why they weren't, all this data on what myths they believed, um, for basically 21 and 22, we were pretty busy talking to provincial governments, state governments um, about the messaging. And I have to say that messaging in all three countries did change because of the data that we shared with them. So in some jurisdictions, the messaging that was first rolled out about the vaccines were kind of shaming people. You know, if you, if you don't care about your relatives or your or vulnerable people in your population, you're a bad person. And shaming, I'm not a psychologist, but we got into reading about this. Shaming is one of the worst things that you can do to try to make somebody do anything. Um, and so a lot of the um, states and provincial governments backed off their shaming campaigns and kind of moved towards what our friends in the indigenous circles did with their campaigns about like, you know, we're doing, we're, we're getting vaccinated for grandma and grandpa and we're getting vaccinated to protect one another because we love one another. Um, as opposed to threatening people, um, you know, or chastising them or shaming them to take the vaccine. With that, I think that one of the things that uh, we also got to see uh, through meetings with governments and uh, different departments was how fast media coverage could change and how fast you could see the messaging change and even conversations on social media then change. And then the next week, seeing Leger and, and our surveys uh, totally represent that changing discussion by the media. And I think that that is really important to note, how fast ideas and how fast our, our minds were working uh, around these issues. And that we just didn't want it. We didn't want to just get out of our houses. We wanted to be protected out of our houses. And that idea of protecting our grandparents, it had to change from protecting those people in nursing homes to actually protecting those people that were in community and our neighbors and uh, those language holders. And that you wanted to be able to hear those stories uh, th that your grandfather could tell or your grandmother could tell your children. And those types of uh, messaging were really drawn from Indigenous communities and really showed a different resonance. And it was just wonderful to see. And there's not many times that a social scientist, especially one that works in areas like constitutional law where legal cases take 20, 30 years sometimes to work their way through the system, 
but it was overnight that we could see a meeting and then messaging by Tam with the next day. And that was really amazing how fast uh, research could get to community and even change government messaging or commercials. So, yeah, I've never seen them move that fast. I would, I probably should shout out to the Association for Canadian Studies and Leger Marketing. They have a little media tracker. Um, last time, and I talked to Jack months ago about this, last time he told me it was over 2,100 media interviews in the course of the three, almost three years that we've been doing this study. Um, so even the media is picking this up, and I think that's actually how public health services picked up on us and how some of the Indigenous um, communities picked up on the work that we were doing, because um, it's hard for us to reach. We can reach out, but if if person's not ready to read the message, they're just going to ignore it, right? <laughs> or they, they'll, they'll not take our call. Um, so I think the media has been very helpful in, in getting the word out about what we're doing. So I know you have a lot of data, three years of data, but in your opinion, what, what, do you, what was the most surprising to you of all of that data, whether the good, the bad, or the ugly, what, what were you most surprised at? Okay, we've been asked that question before. My answer was this, and I'm not gonna change it. How similar the Mexicans are to Canadians. Like, on everything, um, they're just as obedient, just as vaccine-taking as we are. Um, they had a bit of trouble, a bit more trouble with the financial bit. Like, when you ask Mex Mexicans, has the pandemic increased, made your financial commitment the same or worsened? In Mexico, more people were say, would say it was worsened, but they, their government, although they had payments to families to help them through, um, their payments were much lower and it, a much greater proportion of the population was negatively affected financially. Um, so for me, like the fact that our, our brothers and sisters in Mexico are so similar, and from a research perspective, when we talk about North America, researchers really only mean Canada and the US. And honestly, we need to start talking about our friends in the in Mexico, because they are part of North America, <laughs> and we're all a symbiotic trading, um, traveling, sharing group of people, right? So, um, for me, that's really broadened my horizons quite a bit. Well, I, and for me, it's just to repeat actually something that we've already discussed, so I don't need to go on at length. It was there was actually a moment because. Kiera, when she, she got so deep into this, uh, helping out, um, especially when Laurie had to take a step back, um, as much as Kiera says, I don't do survey data, I don't do survey data, she was swimming in it. And, and so there was a moment where she actually had to correct me. I was the one still hypothesizing in my head. I'm saying, oh yeah, vaccine hesitancy, you know, all the information about that history of medical experimentation. And, and she's like, actually, Jeremy, it was just the most. <laughs> so it was a correction of Jeremy's like, actually this is what it says and and so i guess that was just my kind of eye opening moment uh, where, where i actually had to get corrected so it's really interesting because i think we both share that uh same issue i really thought that uh communities would be more impacted by that past but as it turns out communities were more impacted by the past that came before residential schools and talking about uh, those pandemics and that need to survive and that r resilience that has always been there. And I think that that's uh, what surprised me is that not the discussion of all the experiments and the more recent history, but the discussion of uh, a longer past and a longer uh, understanding of that history in, in one's nations. Excellent. Uh, I believe we have time for one more question. Um, we've talked a lot about um, communities that didn't uptake on the vaccine. Uh, I wonder if uh, those groups that had higher percentages of vaccine uptake, uh, such as immigrants, uh, what was the contributor to those groups uh, being more likely to take the vaccine? Okay, so um, there's a phenomenon in data where you have a U-shaped curve. 
And so um, if we look at education, um, we see an awful lot of people who have high levels of education but are vaccine reluctant. And so that is counterintuitive to how we would think about vaccine uptake. Because we would think that people, I mean, this is how the university sells itself, right? You come to university and you learn more and, and, and you're, you're more equipped. And actually the data shows you that, you know, you're, you live longer and you're more healthy. But actually there's a group of very highly educated university people who refuse the vaccine, um, not just in Manitoba, but around the world. Um, and so when you look at um, vaccine uptake, that that general trend that we expected to see higher education, higher vaccine rates wasn't exactly true. Um, it's not surprising that newcomers had higher rates of vaccine uptake um, because by design, like you have to obey to come to Canada. There's rules that you have to fulfill and obey Otherwise, you can't come in the first place. And if you do come, if you don't obey the rules, you get kicked out. Um, so I think that there is a greater sense amongst many newcomer communities that it was their duty, um, maybe slightly threatened if they didn't take the vaccine to take it. Um, I think what was surprising to me was the vaccine uptake amongst Indigenous people in Canada, how high it was, because I think my recollection from the provincial vaccine tax force is there was discussions about how indigenous people might reject the vaccine in large numbers and they didn't i think that manitoba is a outlier for uh, a number if we look across uh, saskatchewan's north or alberta's north and we're an outlier and i think that the reason why uptake was higher uh, was that the army went in and that there was, and that sounds really odd, that the army bringing in vaccines is a reason to get vaccinated. But it was that there was an absolute rollout and an absolute uh, prioritization of entire communities. And elders spoke out when it showed that when uh, community leaders, and we have a, some data on this, that when community leaders got involved and were spokespeople, that more people from the community uh, took vaccines. Uh, but the reverse is also true. So we have a couple communities, and I won't name them, and they're not in Manitoba, uh, where I got countless calls from multiple f federal departments asking, was there anything on our data or anything in my research suitcase or toolbox or anyone that could help out in changing the messaging or encountering some of the influence of a few leaders? And it was uh, very much religion-based in, in one of the communities. And in those communities, there's, the, I think, the lowest uptake of vaccines among First Nations. So I think that leadership was a, a great determinant and in uh, some cases religion uh, was a great determinant or a great detractor from vaccine uptake. And that's hard to tackle no matter how hard you work at messaging. No, I have nothing to add to that. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. And thank you for the questions online and in the room. Uh, and maybe um, we will hear more of your results in due time. Uh, yeah, I would like that. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.